Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Nikhil Devanur, I think second or third time here now. Um, He'll be talking on computation of economic equilibria, and I think that part of the work was done in MSR India. And Nikhil. Thanks, Kamal. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, finding market equilibrium. Uh, when can computers find market equilibrium, and uh, why? So before I go on to answer this question, so let me just say a few words about why this question is important, why should we study this. I mean I do not really mean this in general, but uh, when it comes to computing market equilibrium, finding market equilibrium, for this task, you know, computers are better equipped for this task than most people. So what? So when is… Uh, why is this theory of market equilibrium? So the general economic theory that was developed in economics over the past century is typically used in modeling uh, uh, economies and uh, evaluating economic policies. So for these kinds of applications, uh, an algorithm to find equilibrium is would be very useful. Also, when you want to design a market, so rather than a market that is uh, already there, so you, your goal is to design a market so that it operates at equilibrium. And uh, when you can actually use computational resources in the design of the market. Again, an algorithm to find equilibrium would be very useful. So with, uh, with the internet and all the e-commerce applications, so this is uh, fairly common these days. What about actual markets? So what does this uh, studying computing market equilibrium say, uh, say about the actual markets? Do they actually reach equilibrium? So in a, in a certain uh, setting, some types of algorithms, if they can find equilibrium, then that is an indication that uh, the actual markets do reach equilibrium. So we'll, uh, we'll say more about this uh, later on. And uh, the converse also holds that if the computers cannot find equilibrium, then maybe the markets also do not reach equilibrium. And finally, it is a very uh, natural and interesting problem from uh, the theoretical computer science point of view and uh, it is uh, worth studying. So I am going to be answering the two questions, when can computers find equilibrium and how? So First, we'll see the when. Before I go on to say, you know, when can computers find equilibrium? I have to say, I have to formalize what do you mean by market equilibrium, and I also have to formalize the model of computation. Again, uh, what is market equilibrium? So, in a market, there are agents and there are goods, and uh, agents have preferences over goods, and this preference is captured by uh, what is called a utility function, so denoted by ui. Xi is a vector. Uh, that denotes the amount of each good. So the goods are divisible. So this is just a real vector, real positive vector, and uh, m is the number of goods. So it's a vector in R m plus. And agents have endowments. So this is what they come to the market with. Uh, an endowment again is just a bundle of goods uh, represented by E i, again a real positive vector. So the demand of an agent is the vector that uh, is most preferred among all the vectors that he can afford. So it is a, it's a function of prices of course. So given prices, assume that, uh, is this a laser, okay. which one is the laser pointer? Oh yeah, okay. So assume that uh, the agent can uh, sell all his uh, endowment at those prices and then he gets a income of m i 
and he tries to maximize this utility function subject to this constraint. And what is equilibrium? Equilibrium is when demand is equal to supply. So, it is also uh, uh, said in terms of the excess demand which is simply the demand minus supply. So, you say that it is an equilibrium when the excess demand is 0. So, there is a special case called the Fisher model. In this case, uh, the endowment of each uh, agent is simply a money. So, his demand function is simply given by this problem and uh, the supply is something that is given, there is a given supply. So, this is a case when there is a separation between the buyers and the sellers. So, there are some buyers and there are sellers as opposed to the general model which is an exchange model. So, now let us uh, see what is the model of computation. Again here we will look at uh, two different models. One is a centralized model. Here you assume that you know everything. So, you know all the preferences, all the utility functions, the endowments, the supply, you know everything and you also set all the prices. Uh, so, this is computationally the easier model to work with and uh, you can think of this as you know something that you would use in the modeling application or market design application. So, there is also the distributed uh, model uh, and here you typically have or use only local information. So, for instance, every good could be a computing entity uh, and a good sets its own price and in this case it would know only its demand and its supply, it would not know anything else. And typically in the distributed setting you want simple rules, so you want your algorithm to be simple. And uh, in this talk we will also consider dynamic markets, these are markets where the demand is changing. So, just like uh, you know from the point of uh, view of goods you get a model, you can also consider it from a point of view of agents, where each agent is a computing entity, so you get something different. And uh, this model is harder because you know you can do less and this is an algorithm in this model is supposed to mimic an actual market. The rules are no longer simple. The rules are simple, so that's why it's it's harder to you know find market equilibrium. So the more you can do, the easier it is. The less you can do, the harder it is. So let's see what can be done in the centralized model. So in the centralized setting, you can compute equilibrium when the utility functions are linear. Uh, here it should just be a, a summation over j. So, this is a linear utility function and there is a series of uh, work uh, on uh, computing equilibrium for linear utilities and uh, I think Kamal Jain was eventually one who pinned it down and uh, there is something called uh, utilities with constant elasticity of substitution, so this uh, horrible looking uh, utility function. And for this range of parameters, you can compute, utility, uh, compute equilibrium. Something called Leontief utilities, so which looks like this, and uh, you can compute equilibrium in the Fisher model, uh, special case only. So this is important. And there are uh, these markets with this property of weak gross substitutability. What this says is that uh, suppose you increase the price of good K then the demand for any other good can only go up. So, this is so formalizing that the goods are substitutes and this holds for every pair of goods G and K. And uh, there, is, uh, there are several results uh, showing you know, computation of equilibrium for these markets. Another class of markets called uh, eisenberg markets, uh, again this was defined by uh, Kamal Jain and uh, Vijay Vazirani. So, these are markets in which equilibrium allocations are captured as solutions to convex problems. So, yeah. Is that a formalization of the law of the diminishing returns? No, the law of diminishing returns just says that the utility function is concave. Like everything that I showed here is concave. So, everything here satisfies law of diminishing returns. And in general, the equilibrium theory uh, holds for concave utility functions. So, an example of eisenberg market is this uh, Fisher model with uh, linear utilities. So, 
Another example is uh, this market called the network flow market. So, this is a map of the internet. Uh, why is this a market? So, in this market, people want to route flows, you know, some from some source to some sink, and think of these as the agents. And the edges have capacities; they can only route so much flow. So, these correspond to the goods. So, the agents are competing for these limited resources. So, it's it's a market, and you can formalize it. And uh, prices here correspond to some kind of congestion along the edge. So, maybe you know this is the probability of packet drop or you know, queuing length and so on and so forth. And uh, you want to find these prices so that you know, the, this market operates at equilibrium. So, this is an example of an easy market. So, I am being very informal here just to give you an idea of the kind of markets uh, this class has. And now, uh, in joint work with Ravi Kandan, uh, we can also compute equilibrium for uh, this class of utility functions called piecewise linear and concave. So, before I say more about what uh, this class is, so let me say some hardness results. So, what you can not do or what we think you cannot do. Uh, for this Leontief utilities that I mentioned earlier, computing equilibrium is PPAD hard. So, this uh, coordinate at all result reduce this problem to computing equilibrium in two player Nash and uh, now we know that is a PPAD hard problem. So, this is also PPAD hard. What this means is that you know, we do not, it is unlikely that we can compute uh, equilibrium efficiently for this class. Apart from hardness, there is also a limitation of limitations of the tools that have been used so far. So, in all the cases for which we can compute equilibrium, the set of equilibrium is con convex and this is reflected in the tools used. So, the tools used are like primal dual, ellipsoid, interior point. So, these are typically the ones used for convex programming and what happens when you have disconnected equilibrium? So, it is unlikely that uh, these tools by themselves can uh, extend to this case. There is of course, one technique though that does not face this problem, uh, it is called uh, I call it cell decomposition and it was used earlier for the very simple case of linear utilities with uh, constant number of goods or buyers. And now, we use the cell decomposition technique to, uh, to handle this case. Again here there are uh, two cases, the separable case and the non separable case. So, what is a piecewise linear concave with uh, separable uh, utility functions. So, a separable function is one uh, that can be written as uh, some function of the first argument plus some function of the second argument plus some function of the third argument and so on and so forth. And when each of this function is piecewise linear and concave, so that is our separable piecewise linear concave function. So, piecewise linear concave uh, function in one variable looks something like this. So, we uh, index the pieces by L and uh, the slope of a piece is given by this u i j of L and the width of the piece is uh, given by this v i j of L. Yeah, so we are talking of exact computation here. Okay. So, that is the idea. So, you take any concave function, you just do a piecewise linear approximation and you feed this to the algorithm right. and then the algorithm will give you an exact for this which you which will be approximate for the original thing. So, our algorithm takes this. So, you can do that approximation by yourself. It will depend on the number of pieces. So, this is a class of separable piecewise uh, linear PLC utilities and uh, what we show is we can find we can find the equilibrium exactly if either <coughs> the number of goods or the number of agents is bounded. And as a corollary, we get that uh, the prices are rational. So, they are all rational numbers, that kind of rational. Uh, so, this case it is actually open if this problem is uh, PPAD hard. And I think this is one of the uh, very important open problems to either give an efficient algorithm in general when there is no restriction on the number of goods or the number of agents. 
or show that it is PPD hard. What is known is that uh, there can be disconnected equilibria. No, lean tiff is not separable. That's the thing, and uh, equilibria can be disconnected even when there are two agents, two goods, and each agent has only uh, two pieces. So even for this very simple uh, case, it can be disconnected. So, so this is, uh, this is open the com uh, exact complexity of this. Yeah, everything was convex. No, no, one convex set. Connected convex set. And what about non-separable pieces linear function? I'm sure everyone is familiar with non-separable pieces linear functions in general. So these are many examples. So these are all functions from R square to R, and what you do is you take the R square, the real plane, and you chop it up into small triangles, and in each triangle you have a small, you have a linear function. So that is a piecewise linear function in general. Uh, we will only look at uh, concave functions. So this is an example of piecewise linear. It is not? So this function is neither concave nor convex, right? Oh, I see. Okay. So we, okay, this is another example of some <laughs> function, uh, but we will look at only concave functions. And uh, in general, when you have higher dimensions, each piece. Uh, consists of a simplicial polytope and a linear function on that polytope. So you take a simplicial subdivision of the space and you have a linear function on each of the subdivisions. And since this is a concave function, uh, there is an alternate representation as a minimum of uh, many affine functions. So in this representation, this simplicial subdivision is implicit. So it is given by you know the the polytope in which this particular uh, affine function attains a minimum. That is where, that is the polytope on which it, the value is equal to this. So it is an implicit uh, representation and this is the representation we will use. Is it implicit, implicit of any one or is no, it can have any simplicial subdivision. We do not, we do not assume anything about the structure of the subdivision. And what we show is that uh, uh, for constant number of goods, we can compute e equilibrium exactly. So in this case, it is in general it is PPD hard because as Kamal observed, Leontief utilities is a is a special case. Another thing is, in this case, the equilibrium prices can be irrational, irrational numbers. So what do you mean by uh, computing equilibrium exactly? So what we show is that they are in an algebraic extension of the rational numbers. And uh, how do you represent an algebraic number? Uh, you give a polynomial of which it is a root, but it could be any root of the polynomial. So you also give the signs of the derivatives. Yeah. And do, do, do these numbers remain real or they can go into complex planes? Uh, no, no, they, they are real. real. Yeah. It does not make sense for to be complex. So you represent an algebraic number as a root of a polynomial and you can pin down the particular root by giving the derivatives, all the successive derivatives, the signs of the successive derivatives. And once you have a representation of an algebraic number, then you can represent any number in the algebraic extension of that. And the entire representation is polynomial in the size of the input. So it is an exact algorithm. And it is an open problem if we can do the same for constant number of agents. So remember in the separable case, you could do both for constant number of agents and constant number of goods, whereas here we can only do it for constant number of goods. So in the separable, separable case, you mean either one? Either, either. So now let us see what can be done in the distributed setting. So in the distributed setting, there is this process called the tetonment process that has been uh, uh, studied for over a century by economists and it is a very simple and natural thing. It says, no, so here is a tetonment process. Uh, what it says is, if there is excess demand, then increase your price and if there is excess supply, then decrease your price or if the excess demand is negative. 
So, and then this has been shown to converge for uh, WGS markets, this is weak gross substitute markets that I defined earlier and uh, what uh, we show is that it converges even for dynamic markets. So, earlier the analysis only for static markets which is what I defined, uh, but what if the market is changing which is you know, more uh, common in reality, so, you, the demands and everything, the preferences everything they are changing over time. So, we can analyze this process for the dynamic markets also and we show that this uh, process converges for EG markets also. And the, the way we show this is uh, by showing that this statement process is nothing but running the gradient descent algorithm, which is an algorithm that is uh, shown to do well for the convex optimization problems even in the online setting. So, tetonment means uh, groping. <laughs> so, the prices are somehow groping towards equilibrium. So, what is the major difference between um, uh, static markets and uh, dynamic markets? Like in, 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 I mean, you also assume that the, the market does not change all the time because otherwise it cannot converge at all. So, you assume that it has been in one state. So, I have not told you a very good question, I have not told you what a dynamic market is. So, that is what I am going to say now, what do I mean by dynamic market. So, every day you post some prices, so the prices you post on day T is P T and then you observe the excess demand and then you update your prices and then you see the excess demand and you keep repeating this. And but then I mean this excess demand could be just oscillating between two points right. So, okay, so another thing is we assume that the supply is constant, we do not really need this, but let us just assume this for now. Now, what we define an aggregate market for T days, so, this is a market, the whole market that you observed over T days put together. So, this dividing by 1 by T is just a normalizing thing, it does not really change anything just for convenience. So, what you want to do is you want to converge, so there is an equilibrium for this aggregate market and you want to converge to this equilibrium. So, either you can think of this as aggregate market starting from day 1 or you can also consider a sliding window where you only look at the last t days. So, the, the demand is changing every day. So, it could be coming from different. No, 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 no. It, it could be because the utility function, the preferences themselves changed. So, all that we assume is that the demand is uh, bounded. So, we need some bound on the excess demand that the demand is not too high. But what is the relationship between the price you post T and the demand you observe? So, the thing is yeah, so the, so the assumption is that you only thing is you do not price, po you do not post prices so that the excess demand becomes too high. Our algorithm does not post prices so that the excess demand is too high. But every day after you post your prices then transaction are being taken, are happening. Mm -hmm. okay. So, every day you get a new excess, new demand function. You do not you don't know what the demand function is, you just know that it is bounded. But you need to know the relationship between T and, and because that is what you are controlling, you are just announcing T. So, you need to know the relationship between T and V. I mean, some transactions happen or, or after you post the prices? Yeah, you see the excess demand function. and. Uh, so, you think of it as cumulative. So, maybe on, so think of it as maybe on day 1 you, you saw very high demand, 
but you are allowed to satisfy the demand from the supply that comes in the later days. You say, okay, it is not in stock, I will ship it to you in 10 days. Or if you have things left over, then you can you decrease your prices and then you say, okay, you know, you sell whatever was there left over from day one. So, if, if uh, prices on two days are the same, if I know the same prices, would I see the same demand? Yeah, not necessarily. So, so what is the relation between price and demand? I see. So, you have no control over demand except that it is not going too high. I mean, if I have no control, why do not I just announce high prices every day? Then you will get low demand every day. That's why I am asking. So, so there is a so relationship you, between. You, your demand could be negative also. You do not want, if you post high prices, you know, you will consistently see negative uh, demand. So, on, the, on an average also, you are doing you know, very badly. You are having excess supply left over. Is the excess demand is seen or it is posted also? It is seen, it is just, uh, yeah, you post the price and then you see the excess demand after, after you post the prices. Uh, even if there are goods that can be stored, is this a realistic model? I, I buy something, they say you will have it someday in the future, right? It's not, I'm not willing to say the same price for promises as for a real device, let alone if I buy electric electricity, right? I need electricity for my, for my uh, furnace now and they tell me I can have it tomorrow. No, no, this seems to be no good. So. So, yeah, it is not always reasonable, but it is reasonable in many settings okay. and… Uh, so, like is there a guarantee that I get it next day or can they slip it to forever? So, it depends day? on how, what you assume about your excess demand. Uh -huh. So, so you can also think of it this way. Right? Now it is computed from the previous demand? That, that, no, that is just the market reacts with the excess yes. demand, it reacts with the demand. Basically. So, excess demand is seen as it is created, so step number two creates it. Yeah. Okay. So, the market response… the Whoever the buyers are responding with the but it could be adversary. If, if I mean, what I'm going to understand be. is the relation between the steering and the wheel of a car. How how this relationship is? If I if I don't have a known relationship between steering wheel and, and the actual wheel of the car, so then you, I can't okay, go to my destination. So it's not the excess demand satisfies like it comes from an EG market or it comes from a WGS market. Okay. Okay. So the demand for different goods are related. So, you cannot have arbitrary demands. So, basically what you are saying is you take the previous market and modify them according to the so, Yeah. Then it so, they, they are, in that case, they are hidden UIJs. Yeah, they are hidden, yeah. So, okay. So, okay, so in general, it is very difficult. Behind. In general, it is yeah. very difficult. But, uh, yeah. So, there is some market. So, there okay. is an EG market or there is an WS market. But the parameters of that market themselves could be changing every day. So, like you could have an EG market, but every day the 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 flows, the demands are changing. But so are four not necessarily. No, but, also no, I mean, with but then the adversary can choose any UI. So, so the bond, so the bonds we get will be in terms of this uh, bond on the excess demand. So, which can be thought of as how how much is your demand changing? How widely is your demand changing? If your demand is not changing very widely, this bound on excess demand will be small. So, eventually your convergence rate will be fast. Okay. If this, if your demand is changing very widely, then this bound on the excess demand will be very large. So, your convergence rate will be slow. So, if, if it is unbounded, then you will never converge. So, so assume that you know, you are, you, you are allowed to choose arbitrarily, but you are bounded, you are constrained in how much you can demand by. So, then when you take the average market as you as the convergence time goes to infinity, the average market the effect of any one huge demand is very small, right. So, in, a, in the long run it will it will normalize and it will uh, die down. So, also okay, I mean we show convergence for WGS and EG markets only. So, that is another restriction. So, it may look very surprising that how can this be possible, but Also, you know, there are you can do. Uh, so you can also think of this as doing differential pricing, for instance, because we are offering different prices to buyers in different days, whereas equilibrium has to do the same pricing for all the buyers in all the days. It has to do the same pricing, whereas we are allowed to do differential pricing. So that that is another reason why you know you can you get close to the equilibrium. And uh, so, let me say 
so I said you know we show this uh, uh, we relate this to this online convex programming problem and let me say what is this. So, again here it is very the situation is very similar in every time step the algorithm plays a vector say x t in time t and then the environment responds with a loss function l t. Uh, assume that the loss function is convex and you want to minimize your loss uh, the loss of the algorithm which is this uh, minus the loss incurred by some x star. So, what is this x star? Uh, it is the best vector, best single vector that you could have played on hindsight. So, if you had known all the loss functions, what is one single vector that you could have played? And you want to minimize this average regret and uh, we will we'll consider regret uh, bounds in terms of convergence rate that is how long do you need so that the average regret can be uh, guaranteed to be at most epsilon. So, here again the situation is similar the loss function is arbitrary, but you assume certain bounds on the loss function. So, you can you can uh, guarantee like polynomial convergence rates. So, this also looks like if you have no control over L how can you how can you minimize, but you can do it. So, that is that is the uh, that is the idea. And uh, I said, you know, so the determinant process is with uh, uh, with the goods as computing entities. So here's a situation with uh, the buyers as computing entities. And this is in the context of sponsored search. So if you, so I'm sure everyone is familiar with it. When you go to a search engine and search for something, uh, along with the actual search results called the organic search results, you also get what is called the sponsored search results. So these are the ones. And uh, so these are basically advertisements, and uh, and it's a market. Uh, the advertisers are the buyers, and the queries are the goods. And so advertisers bid for keywords. Uh, for simplicity, let's assume that there's only one slot per query, uh, as opposed to those multiple slots. And uh, the keywords are sold uh, via first prize auction. So what's a first prize auction? It's simply highest bidder wins and paste the uh, paste his bid. A key feature of this uh, sponsored search auctions is that advertisers have daily budgets. So, they have a hard constraint, so you cannot spend more than this and they want to maximize their return on investment. And so, the thing is not all keywords are the same. So, they have different values for different keywords. So, what they want to do is they want to balance their bits across the different keywords you know so in order to maximize their uh, ROI and uh, consider simple strategy where what they do is simply scale all the values by some factor and then and then bid those values. So, this is very similar to the uh, Fisher model with linear utilities. So, wh what do you want to do? Suppose you knew, so the optimum strategy actually looks like this. So, this is easy to prove. So, suppose, so here basically the utilities are linear. So, you get for every keyword you get a, a utility at the same rate at a constant rate. So, what you want to do is you want to identify those uh, keywords which maximize your uh, marginal utility per cost per unit cost and want to buy only those keywords. So, you can show that there is a value so that if you scale it by that value and use the strategy then that gives you the best possible thing. And. Uh, what was shown by a uh, bunch of people here in Microsoft uh, is that instead of doing first price, you do a perturbed first price. You randomly perturb the bits and then do first price. Then this converges for uh, constant updates. What what this means is that you know if uh, an advertiser runs out of money, then you decrease this, this scaling factor by a constant, and if he doesn't run out of money, he you increase by a constant. And then they show that this converges. So, what we show is that even without this perturbation, the first price converges for what uh, I call proportional updates. 
that the updates are proportional to how much budget you are left over with. And uh, even for dynamic markets, so this assume that the number of keywords and everything, number of queries is constant and uh, we can similar to the tetronment process, we can analyze when the supply is actually is actually changing. Okay. So, so let me go on to the how, how do we do all these things. So, first the piecewise linear concave separable case. So, the algorithm is in two steps. The first step is what I call cell decomposition and once we do this, the second step is simply to check for equilibrium in each cell uh, separately. So, what is cell decomposition? It is a fancy name for you, know, you have the price space and uh, you just throw a bunch of hyperplanes and that divides it into small cells. Okay? And uh, the key result we use is the number of cells formed uh, grows as the number of hyperplanes raised to the number of dimensions. And uh, since this is a price space, the number of dimensions is the number of goods which, which we assumed is a constant. So, this is growing as a, like, as a polynomial. And uh, what is the goal of this cell decomposition? The goal is to uh, characterize the optimal bundle for every buyer, so that the second step of checking for equilibrium becomes easy. So, how do we, what kind of characterization do we do? So, what are the hyperplanes we throw in? So, what we throw, what we do is for every agent i, you look at two different pieces, maybe belonging, belonging to two different uh, goods and for every such pair, you throw in this hyperplane. So, what this does is, you now it determines, so this is, this quantity is the marginal utility per unit, this is the cost. So, this gives a marginal utility per unit cost and once you throw in all the hyperplanes, you can order the pieces according to decreasing order of uh, marginal utility per unit cost. And uh, so, we are allowed to have equalities for certain hyperplanes. So, once you do this ordering, you know, it is divided into equivalence classes and uh, how does the optimal bundle look? So, what the buyer does is he buys all the pieces in the first class and then all the pieces in the second class and so on until he runs out of budget. So, what this does not determine is where he will run out of budget. What is his last class of pieces in the optimal allocation? So, we can actually pin that down also by throwing in more hyperplanes. So, what is this hyperplane saying? It is saying, you know, the buyer can buy everything up to the first k minus 1 classes. So, you throw in these hyperplanes for every k, for every i. And once you throw in these hyperplanes, now you can actually say, okay, he buys all of these classes and then sum of the last class. So, you do not know how much, but you, you know that, you know, which is the last class. And note that what we achieved is, you can do this for every buyer. So, typically when you do it for every buyer, you know, the combinatorial explosion gives you something to the power of the number of buyers. But because we did it using cell decomposition, the complexity only grows as a number of goods as opposed to the number of buyers and, and that is that is key, that is important. Now, all we are left with is, how do you find this last class? What are the allocations? Are there allocations in this last class, so that the market clears? And uh, so, this problem turns out to be equivalent to finding, if there is a fractional weighted perfect matching in this bipartite graph. So, this is uh, on one side are all the goods, are m of them indexed by j, the other side are the uh, buyers, n of them indexed by i and there is an edge between i and j. If uh, you know j is one of the pieces in the last class of i, so if i has could buy j partially and there are weights, uh, weights on the edges is just uh, the cost of this uh, piece in this last class and the weights on the goods are the price minus the cost of all the pieces in the earlier classes. Again, the weights on the buyers is uh, money they come come with, uh, or their income, 
minus the cost of all the pieces in the last class. So, note that typically when you define a, a problem, a perfect matching problem, these are all constants. But here these themselves are variables because the prices are variables. But still this entire thing is a linear system of equations and inequalities. So, we can solve them. So, for every cell we can see if there is a solution to this system, if there is that is an equilibrium and you know you can you can do this in parallel for all the cells. That's an observation. So, this will this will find all the equilibrium points because we are doing for each cell separately. So, are there any questions on this? I have left out some details, so it is okay to be little puzzled. So, what about the non separable utilities? Uh, again, the idea is similar, it is just that you know the kind of each step is much more harder in this case. So, what we want to do is the first step we want to say narrow the optimal bundle down to one piece modulo the particular vector in that piece. So, we know that some, so you want to uh, do cell decomposition, so that for every agent we can say okay the optimal bundle is on this piece and uh, it satisfies this equation, because you know an agent will use up all his uh, money when he maximizes his utility. So, it, we know it is some x in p i that satisfies this. So, this is our goal and uh, so for non separable utility functions this is a much harder problem and uh, what we show is that this is equivalent to saying that p lies in the cone of these UILs for the appropriate UILs and the and in we have to consider the appropriate dimensions also. Uh, so, we have to throw in hyperplanes that uh, can determine these kinds of things and uh, we have to throw in hyperplanes of this kind. So, where z's are all the vertices in the simplicial subdivision. So, in order to make sure that this piece and this uh, hyperplane here actually intersect. So, we can do all this using cell decomposition, so we can do this using cell decomposition. So, we can narrow down it to one piece and then modulo this. Yeah, yeah, this is in the centralized setting, so you know everything, you know this piecewise linear function. Okay, so, once we do that, we still have to do the second part, which is checking for an equilibrium allocation. So, what we want to do is, okay, for each i, we want to pick some x i in p i, uh, so that p dot x i is m i and we want to satisfy this clearing con conditions. So, here I have just assumed that the supply is 1, just a normalization. Uh, so, note that now the constraints are quadratic. So, we are trying to solve a system of quadratic equations and such a system with even one quadratic constraint is actually n p hard. Okay, so, there is p dot x i right. So, also earlier this in the separable case this turned out to be simply of the form you know 0 less than x i less than something or you know just upper and lower bounds on x i's x i j's and that is the reason we could do it uh, uh, with just we could reduce it to a linear system, but, but now this can be these can be arbitrary polytopes. So, that is the reason why you know you cannot reduce the whole thing to linear system. P is a function of no, p is an independent variable, p is are all the, also the variables, p is also the variables and x s are also variables. So, you would have these quadratic constraints even in the earlier case, but you know we did a reduction so that it reduces to a linear case and that reduction worked because these were simply you know upper and lower bounds. But now since these are general polytops we cannot do such a reduction. So, what are the constraints on P 
P is just constrained to be in that particular cell. So, for each cell we, we just say okay, P is in this cell and then we want to solve, we want to see if there exists X size that satisfy these constraints. So, the whole thing is a quadratic system and I mean even in general even one quadratic constraint is hard to solve with if you have many uh, constraints and just one quadratic constraint, it is hard to solve. But we exploit a structure in this, uh, namely that uh, these x i's are tied together by these uh, equations, other than this they are independent and uh, these are only m. So, this is a structure we exploit and we use Lagrangian relaxation on these m clearing constraints to convert this statement of the form there exists x into a statement of the form for all q, where q is m dimensional, because there were m constraints we get a m dimensional uh, vector q. Now, we have to solve a polynomial system of equalities and inequalities in p and q, which are 2 m variables, which is just constant number of dimensions and uh, we use tools from computational algebraic geometry to actually solve this. And of course, uh, I know this is a high level idea, I cannot go into all the details, but that is that is the idea. Uh, I am sure somewhere down here so uh, deep down, it is small number of time, I am not, it is not, I am not sure exactly, we kind of use this as a black box. So, yeah, but here it is only 2 m variables. So, the running time is going to be you know something to the power of 2 m, that is okay with me, yeah. So, let us see how uh, groping. <laughs> groping works. <laughs> so, as I said the main technical thing that we show is that tetonment is the same as gradient descent. Okay, so, what is gradient descent? Again, it is very similar to tetonment. Uh, it is a it is an algorithm for minimizing a convex function. It just says that you start from any point and then you move in the direction of uh, the gradient and proportional to the gradient from parameter eta t. And uh, so, this thing converges fast even for this online problem. And what we show is we give a convex function of the prices that is minimized at the equilibrium. And we show that the gradient of this function is basically equal to excess supply. So, the negative gradient is excess demand. So, what is this function? So, this is function d of p which is the summation of prices minus this quantity uh, summed over all i m i log beta i. What is beta i? Beta is the minimum so, this is a reciprocal of the marginal utility per unit cost. So, it is a you know minimum or pj or uij for every i. So, this is this is it, this is a convex fun function. And uh, so for the experts here, this is actually this is actually dual to the uh, well known Eisenberg Gale convex program. And why is why does this why is it minimized at equilibrium? this is going to follow from our uh, from what we show that the gradient is excess supply. So, convex function is minimized when the gradient is 0. So, that means excess supply is 0 which is equilibrium. So, why is gradient equal to excess supply? So, first step in this thing is to write this function as in this format where L of x p is some function that is linear in p for every x. So, this actually shows d p is convex, where you are writing it as maximum of many uh, linear functions. This x is actually going to be the allocation matrix x i j s and this is what L of x p is. So, we have the summation of p j s here and for every i now we have something like this and these are constant terms. Okay. So, here the u i is the uh, this term, just a shorthand for this. So, the interesting thing is 
an x i that maximizes this term m i log u i minus p j x i j is exactly the same x i that maximizes u i subject to the budget constraint. Okay, so, this is I am not going to show why this is, this is very easy, but this is the key thing that we use. So, an x i that maximizes this is really the demand function and for, for a demand it turns out that the beta that we defined is simply equal to m i by u i. So, if you look at these terms, this p j x i j cancels with m i because when you maximize this this is equality and this m i log u i minus m i log m i because of this you get simply get minus m i log beta i. So, you get our function d. So, okay, once you once you do this the rest is very easy. So, actually this function is not differentiable. So, I cannot talk of gradients, but I can talk of subgradients. So, what is a subgradient? L sub lambda is a subgradient at uh, p if it satisfies this. For all q, dq minus dp should be bigger than lambda times q minus p. So, this is lambda is a vector. So, let us see why the, the excess supply is a subgradient. So, suppose dp was maximized by x star. Uh, then you look at dq minus dp, it is bigger than L of x star q minus L of x star p because dq is the maximum over all x. So, it is at least L of x star q and dp is simply equal to L of x star p. And these are linear functions and all the terms that do not involve p or q just cancel out because it is the same x star and you get this summation j q j minus p j is multiplied by this term because in L of x p you have p j here and p j x i j is here. So, you get that the multiplier is this which is excess supply. So, note that okay, so all this was for linear utilities and for linear utilities the demand is not unique. So, one of the difficulties in analyzing determinant was this non uniqueness thing. So, determinant makes sense when it when the demand is unique, but when it is not unique you do not know which demand to pick. So, what this says is that you could pick any demand it does not matter and now just we just use results from the online connex programming and we get uh, convergence here. So, another simple things to note is that if the market on day t corresponds to a uh, function d t then the aggregate market for t days will correspond to this function this is very easy to see. So, now minimizing you now we just want to minimize this function which is uh, what the online convex programming gives and it gives a rate of convergence of uh, g by epsilon square where g is this thing. So, you know if so this is what I was saying about bounding the demand and so on. So, actually there is a another algorithm for uh, online convex programming called exponentiated gradient and uh, you know that gives a uh, a somewhat better convergence points in some cases. So, what about like say network flow market what would be the function the function would be you know the price is weighted by the capacities minus again m i log beta i where beta i is the cost of the uh, the shortest path and I mean this works for you know all EG market. And what about this bid optimization? So, basically what we do is essentially the same thing. So, this d instead of function of instead of thinking of uh, thinking of it as a function of the prices, we can think of it as a function of the beta i's and these beta i's are exactly the multipliers that we that we uh, talked about in the bid optimization. And you now simply have to do gradient descent it turns out that the gradient in this case is the excess budget divided by the beta i. So, that is a gradient. So, you just run gradient descent and then this will also convert, but there is a caveat here. So, here I mean the gradient is the excess budget if the budget was ignored. So, the excess budget is positive it is fine because you know how much the budget is 
how much of your budget is left over. But if it is negative, you may not know how much it would have been negative because you just stopped when your budget ran out. So, one way to resolve this is to say that okay, the search engine gives this bit of information as a feedback and then the advertisers use this in order to uh, update their bids. What else can be done? We can also analyze this markets with WGS. So, in this case the relation between the gradient and excess supply is not explicit. So, the story is more complicated. We simply use the excess demand in place of gradient and it turns out that we can get uh, similar convergence uh, relations. And an interesting question here is, so is there, a, is there an explicit uh, convex function that is minimized at equilibrium and whose gradient is equal to the excess supply? So, the conjecture is that there should be one and, uh, but we do not know how. That would be, it is an interesting open problem is to find such a concave, uh, convex function. Uh, other uh, open problems are to actually convert these algorithms say for the network flow markets into network protocols. So, it can be actually implemented like the TCP IP protocols and that hopefully can be guaranteed to converge even when the uh, uh, network is changing, the demands are changing. Also what about you know, other markets, can you do similar things for other markets and uh, this is work in progress. One thing as I mentioned earlier, this is giving is a way to do differential pricing. So, the conjecture is if you are allowed to do differential pricing, then you can actually get close to equilibrium even for, uh, for general markets. And uh, so, that is something that that's, that we are uh, still uh, working on. So, this to summarize this notion, this point of view that you know the tetonment is uh, gradient descent has has many applications and these things from techniques from online uh, learning are really applicable in here in, in pricing problem. Any, any questions? Thank you.